Welcome to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. I'm your host, Tad Hussey of Kiss Organics. This is the podcast where we discuss the cutting edge of growing from a science-based perspective and draw on top experts from around the industry to share their wisdom and knowledge. Now, to date, I've had few guests on the show that grow using mineral salts or chemical fertilizers, the majority of my guests using organic production, mainly because I'm big on organics and that's the side of the industry I'm most familiar with. However, there is a lot of science in recent years coming from universities and researchers using chemical nutrients, and I think as a science-based podcast, we need to cover all aspects of cultivation. Not only is there a lot to learn from our fellow cultivators, regardless of methodology, but I realize that chemical nutrients are here to stay, and there are pros and cons to using chemical nutrients as well as organics. Now, if we can grow more sustainably or use more environmentally friendly methods that reduce salts in our runoff, then I'm all for it. Using nutrients that have a smaller fossil fuel footprint, reduce runoff, contain less heavy metals, and allow us to maximize plant health and growth is important on both sides of the industry, and this is something we discuss today in greater depth. My guest this week is Carrie Peters. She is the vice president at J.R. Peters and the formulator of all products and development of new fertilizer formulas that provide crop-specific solutions to growers' nutritional issues. She has too many honors and accolades to list here, but I will put them up on the podcast page. Carrie has a PhD in plant sciences and a master's of science in agronomy from the University of Maryland, as well as a bachelor's of science in biology. She's the third generation of Peters in the family's business, which was founded over 72 years ago. Now on to the show. Hey, Carrie, glad we got to connect. Finally, I'm really excited to have you on the show. Hi, nice to connect with you, Tad. Super excited to be here. Thank you. Yeah, let's start off by giving listeners a little bit of your background so they know uh, who they're listening to today. Yeah, well, I'm Dr. Carrie Peters, and I guess my title that they're trying to be a little more fun and cool instead of chemist, I'm the master crafter and formulator of Jack's fertilizer. Um, and we make fertilizers for a whole bunch of different things all over the world here, and we're based in Allentown, Pennsylvania. So, yeah, I'm the formulator for this crew here. <laughs> now, you spent some time in, in school studying this sort of thing, right? Can you touch a little bit on your academic background? Yeah, for sure. I mean, the cool thing about Being in a family business is, and that's what we have here. Jax is a family business. We've been, that was founded in 1947. You kind of grow up just thinking that everybody knows things about plants and and plant nutrients and the science behind it. But turns out, you know, what you hear from your grandparents isn't always, you know, fact-based. So I went to school, I actually was a biology major in, uh, for my undergrad and a chemistry background. And then for my master's, I got my master's in agronomy with the USDA and I worked with plants that um, accumulated heavy metals. So that was really cool, you know, all over this, this USDA kind of project was all over the world and plants that hyperaccumulate nickel and cadmium and zinc. And then to kind of bring it back to things I needed to know to join my family company, my um, PhD is in plant nutrition from the University of Maryland, and I spent a lot of time with geraniums. Geraniums, is, even though they annoy a lot of people, they're my favorite crop, and I looked at uh, nutrient uptake under different conditions. So, yeah, I did, you know, finally get out of school and was able to bring that knowledge back to my uh, family company in 2004, and I've been with them ever since, kind of crafting and and bringing my kind of, I don't know, my my little influence into how we build um, fertilizers under the Jack's name. So you definitely have the background to bring science to the table uh, when it comes to these formulations. And I I, want to start off talking a little bit about uh, about your companies. Um, But I do want to touch on uh, the heavy metal stuff. I want to touch on water and some of these other aspects. 
Uh, but let's start off just talking about, because uh, this is a little bit out there for me in the sense that I'm, I'm an organic guy. I don't have any experience growing with mineral salts or chemical fertilizers. Uh, and your company, that's sort of your world. Uh, let's, yep. Can we talk a little bit about some of the uh, you know, sustainab sustainability aspects of uh, mineral salts or chemical fertilizers? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it is so interesting because, um, you know, our, my whole family, you're right, like grew up in this mineral world. And actually in Allentown, Pennsylvania, in our little town here, there is the company called Rodale who did um, Runner's World and Organic Magazine. And they, they lived right across the street from my grandfather. Oh, wow. So they always used to have these like really cool discussions about, you know, the beginning of the organic movement. And this was in the like 60s and 70s to, you know, how my grandfather was moving forward. So it's kind of neat. Um, but yeah, we, we are a company that truly the majority of what we do is we blend water soluble powders and in different, you know, ratios and concentrations in order to deliver these really soluble and available nutrients to the plant. Um, we make for our products, it's under the name of Jack's. You'll see Jack's professional and horticulture, um, and also like specialty ag all over the world. And then Jack's nutrients goes into cannabis and hemp. And then the Jack's classic line is like for home gardeners. We, we don't sell to, um, like Home Depot and Walmart and stuff like that, but we, it's independent garden centers and kind of mom and pop main street America things, but it's all these really quality and qualified raw materials that are these nutrient salts that we take them from like, you know, it's a global market, right? You're getting them from all over the world and we qualify them for low heavy metals and the purity and solubility that we find is our standard at Jack's. And that's how we go about putting together the products that we have out there under our name. So does that make sense? It does. So I'm, I'm trying to think how to approach this here. I want I want to kind of have a little bit of a debate, a friendly debate, that is, on some of the pros right. and cons of organics versus, um, you know, chemical fertilizers. And, uh, you know, there's there are definite pros and cons on both sides. So I'm going to mm -hmm. list a few and, and, you know, tell me what I miss here. But I'm just thinking off the top of my head. Uh, some of the, the cons with mineral salts are uh, risk of over application and leaching into our groundwater. Right. Um, cost in terms of manufacturing and, and freighting and stuff to get some of these mineral salts processed and produced and, and to, you know, to your location. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. th those are the two major ones I think of. Um, in terms of benefits, yeah. you have the ability to really craft something exactly the way you want it and, and in terms of consistency um, and, and mm -hmm. the ability to replicate something, I think you have a lot more control than we do in organics. Um, what are some of the other pros and cons around there, at least on the, on the mineral salt side? Yeah, we, we do get this quite a bit because like you said before, my world is a hundred percent this mineral side of it. But, um, you know, when we look at, when you look at delivering nutrients to a plant, a lot, and and we, we have a laboratory on site here that we do a lot of um, testing of all different crops. And, and honestly, we never really ask, like, what nutrients are you using? Like, we're not going to test it if you're not using Jack. But what that does is gives a, a real insight on the nutrient targets or nutrient requirements that different crops grown in all these, these different environmental conditions um, kind of require. And like you said, the, the, I, I think, in my opinion, the biggest benefit is being able to hit nutrient targets exactly with mineral um, raw materials. So we're able to, you know, say we would like a, a formula to deliver, you know, 40% of its nitrogen from a nitrate base, and we can exactly match that. Um, it, there's, there's a difference when you talk about cons, like, what you're saying is so true that some of the mineral sources out there that are, you know, 
chemical fertilizers are horrible quality. Like you're getting them from sources you don't know where they're coming from. They have, you know, not so great things in there as byproducts or others. Um, the most obvious that everyone worries about is heavy metals, of course, arsenic, lead, lead cadmium, um, you know, all, all of those types of things. But there's also just you know, other byproducts that really the plant doesn't need. And when you apply them at the wrong rate, they do kind of take up the spaces in the root zone, the large and small pore spaces, and it, it doesn't allow for great root growth. And, you know, it can lead to all this buildup in there. Um, so overall, you run into that quite a bit with, with choosing mineral fertilizers. Like when we talk about jacks, we don't, we, that's why I'm saying we, we qualify these raw materials to be these really pure sources. So, like, if we're using a potassium source, we would choose something like a potassium nitrate, which is super, and even the, the grade of it is super um, soluble and available, and it's, you know, giving potassium to the plant attached to a nitrate. You know, some of the things you can see by, in the, you know, grocery stores of these not-so-great fertilizers have a potassium source as a p- potassium chloride. I mean, no plant wants to have a root zone filled with chloride. And yes, you will get potassium from it, but it's also coming with this salt that isn't great. So if that kind of makes sense, you have like good mineral salts and bad mineral salts. You know what I mean? Does that yeah, kind of qualify and- it a bit? One other aspect of that too, I would think in terms of sustainability is not over applying these chemical fertilizers. So your spent media at the end of your grow should be fairly low EC, I I would expect if you want to do this as sustainably as possible. Yeah, and that's one of the cool things that when we work with growers and we work with a lot of like hybrid growers too that you know, obviously aren't like OMRI listed type people, but are trying to build the sustainability of their operation. So they're using a a mixture of a mineral and an organic approach. But we, we go crop by crop and develop these nutrient targets. So you're looking at, okay, uh, you know, I only need 30 parts per million of phosphorus. That's all we're trying to deliver. How do we get there? You know what I mean? Like, are you using this as a nutrient amendment? We'll use some water soluble as like an available kind of shot of, of, of fertilizer solution. But in reality, we are never, we're trying never to over apply because the plant doesn't need more. You know what I mean? More isn't better <laughs> in most cases. Yeah, and just to be fair, I want to talk about some of the pros and cons on the organic side. Um, so in terms of organics, I think the advantages we have are that it is organic, um, mm-hmm. uh, the, the, which is a big, uh, big point to a lot of people, including myself. Um, some of the challenges and disadvantages are that we, we can't quite hit these targets quite as exactly because nutrients are being released over time. They're requiring a microbial... Yeah action or uh, process in order to become available to the plant in most cases. Uh, there are still some sustainability issues depending on what that uh, nutrient is and where it's sourced from, that amendment, you know, coming some cocoa core comes from tropical locations, uh, you know, neem karanja, mm-hmm. some of these things are not locally produced. So there is that fossil fuel cost to get it to us. Um, some of the advantages are that we, a lot of people are reusing their soil and that's something that we talk about in here um, that I work with a lot of growers on, uh, but that doesn't give us the same level of consistency that you would get from, you know, a, a mineral salt program. Uh, so I think that's, yeah. uh, you know, I just want to be fair here in terms of the, the pros and cons on both sides. Um, oh yeah. And I, it sounds silly, but being a plant nutritionist, that I, you know, and, and, and the chemistry side, the like alchemy side of, of mixing things together to like provide nutrients to the plant. I'm always open to, you know, coming up and working with growers with these hybrid programs or even just helping them understand the nutrient profile with whatever they're using. So that's kind of the fun side of what we do here at J.R. Peters because we have our lab 
we get to really look at the crop and, and how people are growing it all different ways. So I love these heated debates. This isn't too heated, though, Chad. <laughs> so, uh, you know, just good conversation. <laughs> sure, sure. No, you, we have a lot of mutual friends, and I've heard such great stuff about you. I'm certainly not going to um, be too hard on you. Uh, I Here's one, though, that might be a little bit more contentious. I've always uh-huh. thought it was a little arrogant of us as humans to think that we could formulate a nutrient solution for a plant better than nature. Um, now, not when it comes to yield necessarily, but I mean, th- that kind of brings in the whole idea of steroids. You know, obviously we can pump a plant full of something and grow it bigger, but is it healthier or is, nu- or is nutritious or going to have the same terpene expression as you might get from, you know, a well-managed organic grow? Yeah, and that's definitely something that that we discuss constantly here in our, like, inner tech team meetings. You know, are we truly missing out because we're just so focused on these targets? And that's why we, we, we're always, you know, looking at, you know, other additives and things that might be useful in enhancing a, a root zone. But I hear what you're saying for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and... You know, unfortunately, like the fun part of my job is being so like, like um, intense on this mineral side that you kind of, you know, love to hear everyone's opinion. But we still just with Jax are trying to make sure we have the most soluble and available mineral blend. So it does kind of put blinders on, if you know what I mean, a bit. Well, I, I will admit I am jealous in your ability to research and 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 do studies because, you know, a lot of people don't want to touch organics in a lot of ways because there are so many variables involved in every um, growing scenario, especially when we talk about soils or living soils, as people are calling them. Um, Really, really hard to do research on it compared to, uh, you know, a chemical grow like this with an inert media or something that's really consistent. So in that sense, I, I am jealous of your ability to do research in a lot of this stuff. And I think, too, like, what was, what you know, the, the background of our company is mostly, like, um, especially ag and horticulture back when it started in the 40s and 50s. But as cannabis has really, you know, stepped into the limelight over, you know, with, in the illegal and legal side of it, we've gotten to see so many more people kind of jumping into this. And what I'm super excited for is now finally the universities are going to be able to, you know, put out some of these um, research-based studies and and bring some of this to light a little bit more than what what has gone on in the past. And I think that will help all of us um, really jump into the perfect kind of scenario in exactly what you're saying, like plant yield, plant quality, and um, expression of, of the final product, too, for hemp and cannabis. And that's, that's what excites us here at Jax. We, we work with a lot of different universities to kind of, you know, provide the, the mineral side of it. So I can't wait to see that as we, you know, move forward 2021 and beyond. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm under the impression that if we're talking about strictly yield, that a combination of organics and synthetics is the optimal way for, for increasing and getting the highest levels of yield. And I'm, I'm saying this only based on my own anecdotal evidence and what I've seen out of the giant pumpkin growers. You know, they kind of maxed mm-hmm. out around 2,000 pounds. Um, oh, sorry, around 1,000 pounds um, back in the 90s. And then they started incorporating, you know, some biologicals like mycorrhizal fungus, started treating their patches with a little bit more um, care from an organic perspective and along mm-hmm. with genetic improvements, which is huge um, as well. They they're now up over twenty five hundred pounds with these these pumpkins. And it's pretty incredible. And it's sort of this hybrid method. Um, what is your yep. experience with sort of, you know, hybrid methods in regards to yield versus, um, you know, a strict organic or mineral salt approach? Well, and like I said, this is the this is the cool part about having the lab here because we're kind of we're really able to work with growers doing all different things to kind of track where they started, what amendments they're using, and then match that to data to like nutrient concentrations in the tissue and in the root zone. 
So we've seen a lot of different things. And like, it's, it's so difficult for me specifically to say, oh, I lean one way or another, because I, I feel that people tend to have, uh, I don't know, their own ability to make whatever choice they decide to go with work well. I've seen a lot of growers using strict mineral fertilizers, ours or otherwise, do unbelievable yields in hemp and cannabis. Mm -hmm. And then again, I've seen other growers really be able to cultivate this living soil, you not even utilize a mineral component at all, and be able to reach very similar or, you know, exactly the same type of yield um, in, 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 in the same varieties that they're growing. So it's, it's so many factors, I think now, Tad, that it's hard to, you know, say one, you know, one way is better than another. So I agree with you, this hybrid approach I've found has been really successful for most people either starting out in their own like home environments or even slightly larger than that or moving forward. But I have to say there's, there are a lot of growers we work with that have these multi-state operations that really are on the path to, you know, making this as efficient as possible. So I know you talked about that in the beginning, that efficiency and, you know, when you look at how much these inputs cost and the sustainability of where you're getting them from, that's going to be very important as this market kind of moves forward. And, the mineral side of it does have a really low cost in use, you know, when you're talking about like how much the powder costs versus all these liquid amendments being shipped all over the country. So, you know, absolutely. It's very interesting to see. I mean, if, if you're going to go with a mineral salt, I think, you know, powdered is the way to go. People can mix with their own water, um, you know, shipping, right. shipping water <laughs> no one around needs the country. Allentown water. Yeah. <laughs> Well, um, you know, I feel like we've covered that pretty well. I know people are going to want to talk about water. Um, you've mentioned he- your experience with heavy metals. Why don't we start yeah. there, though? Because I, you know, I talk to people all the time, and th- that's always a challenge is, you know, limiting arsenic, limiting cadmium, um, lead, for example. Where are mm-hmm. you finding these cropping up the most? What are the, like, most common sources of contamination, um, you know, obviously nutrient solutions, soil are, are big ones, um, yeah. water. What other things should people be watching for if they want to limit their exposure to these? Well, specifically, I see a lot of heavy metals coming in as carrier, um, I guess, byproducts in these individual nutrients. So, you know, if you're adding in some sort of nitrogen or calcium source as into your root zone, you got to watch for the heavy metals there. One of the things that we see quite often is people are using gypsum in their root zone to try and, you know, add a soluble calcium source that's a little little longer lasting and doesn't um, affect the pH of the root zone. We found a lot of gypsum sources having cadmium. Cadmium is basically the main one but we've also seen arsenic and lead in there. And that's just something that you don't think of. You're like, oh, gypsum, that's, you know, a a really nice way to get a good calcium source. And then you don't realize it's coming with all of these kind of carrier terrible things in there. Um, I'm trying to think, like we also seem to, in almost every single nutrient that we're, we're bringing in as a raw material from sources all over the world, we always see some level or another of heavy metals in there. So for people to say, oh, I, I'm doing stuff that has zero heavy metals, it's impossible. It's always there. It's just trying to get a refined material that has the lowest amount possible. That's, that's what we strive at at Jack's. And it's very, very difficult. We, we have a whole kind of QAQC qualification process to try and keep these levels as low as possible. And we're paying attention. Can you imagine if people weren't paying attention? You know, that's what worries me. Yeah, it's a, it's a challenge. Um, 
I have a few thoughts on that. So first off, like I chose to get my soil uh, registered as a fertilizer. So it would have heavy metal testing and come under that same level of scrutiny as your fertilizers. Cause I think that's important. Yeah. I don't know of anyone great. else that's doing that, but, um, there's a lot of challenges around it, like you said. And, um, you know, especially on the organic side, you know, we're testing our amendments, but you know, things can change batch to batch. And so we're constantly trying to monitor that. Um, you know, you said gypsum, that wasn't even really one on my radar. I think of like rock dusts, um, for example, mm -hmm. that people are using kelp meal, uh, things like that for inputs, um, feather meal. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's something growers really need to be aware of and monitor. But let's say you had a, a field that did have, you know, you had a crop that failed at right. that point. What, what would you try and do to remediate that? Would you have them grow a, a hemp crop or some other accumulator possibly to get some of that, you know, arsenic or something into the, the biomass of the plant to dispose of? Um, how do we manage I think, things like that? I think that that is where hopefully we will be able to move um, over the, you know, future years to come here because the hyper accumulator research, like we know that there's certain species of plants that take up heavy metals really well. And they do that up in at least six to eight inches of the root zone. So by planting like a crop, a cover crop almost, and some of these are like, you know, from the mustard family or sunflower family or cabbage family, and, and just planting a crop of, of those types of, of plants to remove the heavy metals. And, and we know that they're excellent at cadmium, zinc, nickel, selenium. The ones we know that have harder problems are like arsenic in there. But um, it, it would be, that's the way to go. I just don't know how often people are thinking of doing that right now. I know a few growers that are growing outside in these situations in areas of the, of the U.S. here that do have soils that are extremely high in heavy metals. And not only is it just in the root zone, it's also like the dust. So if like it's dusty and you get that dust on your plants, you can effectively fail a crop because that dust is now stuck to your, you know, your sticky bud. And it's been a real, real problem um, around the country. And, and let's be fair that some of these testing um, things are showing huge variability, I found, in, res in the results that yeah. growers are getting. So they'll pass at one lab and fail at another. Um, so we obviously have variability there. Some of the laws, I think, are a little too stringent around this since we don't really know what levels are acceptable or safe. Um, and we're not testing right. our vegetables like this. It's really crazy that cannabis has this completely different standard. Um, I, I don't oh, know. I a hundred percent agree. <laughs> it's, it's frustrating. It's extremely frustrating. And like, I also feel like the, the group that regulates this in our country is um, the American um, plant food control officials that do a lot of regulating for, like you said, you're registering your soils as a fertilizer they are uh, definitely a, a smart group of people, but they are operating on a state level. So it's there's just even from one state to another, there's all these different requirements and recommendations that, you know, could really be useful if, if we are going to, you know, step cannabis and, and quality products coming into our country how it's regulated needs to be something that's that's on a, a larger level and not specific to each state. It's super frustrating, as I'm sure you know, in registration to try and make sense of, you know, what people are asking for. So it's tough. So we just, at Jax, we just try and qualify every raw material to have the lowest possible and, and keep that in a non-detectable or, you know, uh, as low as possible for all of these specific heavy metals. And it's, it keeps us busy for sure. <laughs> yeah. We're doing a similar thing in terms of just trying to be as low as possible and constantly trying to innovate if we find ways to, you know, lower our, our levels even more, right. but it's a, it's a constant process. Um, one thing I do want to mention too, is that genetics appears to play a pretty big role in all of this mm -hmm. as well. So people need to be aware of that. Um, I'm seeing a lot of times where uh, 
just a portion of a crop will fail. Uh, so obviously yeah. cultivar selection is huge um, when it comes to this heavy metal uptake, uh, you know, something to consider. I, well. I 100% agree. That's why it'll be kind of neat to see if we start to really pull out these cultivars that are the high performers and, and we can also, you know, pay attention to those other traits like heavy metal hyperaccumulation and get that data out for others to so that when we're, you know, growers are making selections on what they want to grow or what they want to breed themselves, they can, um, you know, utilize some of the data that they have on these cultivars. And it's not kind of like, oh, my friend down the street's growing this and that worked well, that type of thing. And that will only come in time as there's more like research kind of published and out there for us to ponder. (laughs) So when we talk about, you know, using mineral salts, a lot of people on the organic side, uh, you know, are, are concerned that these salts are going to be killing off microorganisms in their soil if they're also gardening in a manner that um, includes, you know, biological inputs, compost, things, you know, they're trying to get nutrient cycling going. Mm-hmm. Uh, from a microbial perspective, what are the effects of salts on, um, you know, on soils? Well, that's, that's a great question, and that's something that we get asked quite a bit um, because, again, th- there is a lot of misconception out there when you're thinking about, you know, people saying, oh, it's salt. So there, there's a qualification of, like, good salts and bad salts. And obviously, um, the bad salts are the things that you, you probably think of, sodium and chloride, and they're, they're the ones that, that can have quite a... Uh, destructive um, characteristic in the root zone because the plant is it needs there is some requirement for a sodium or a chloride ion in the life cycle of any plant growing but it's super low and this is where and I know you said this in the beginning you talk about application rate so providing nutrients to the soil in the right concentration so that they're available for plant uptake and also for soil microbe use. You know, nutrients are a a source of food for the good things that live in your soil too. And they're not qualifying it as, oh, this calcium is coming from a mineral base versus an organic base. They're seeing that nutrient as as a charged entity and utilize it that way as a food source or otherwise. But if you're, you know slamming it down there and bombarding things with calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, nitrogen, it's just going to be like an overload and you can do quite a bit of damage, you know, as, as, and what people have seen is, you know, killing off these wonderful environments because the application rate was, was way too high. So on our side of things, we always try and get, people to understand the the concept of like a constant liquid feeding, which is really a low, low rate and overall parts per million of a nutrient solution that's quite a bit lower than, than you would see or think about and feeding that every time the pl- every time the plant needs water. So it's getting this constant low stream of a balanced nutrition from a mineral from our mineral type source. Does that make sense? Yeah, so low levels of mineral salts you're saying are not going to necessarily cause this osmotic shock in your soil and kill off all the microorganisms um, when they're applied at a proper dosage. Right, correct. And, and then to kind of follow up on that question, how do chemical fertilizers interact with biostimulants? Uh, and when I say biostimulants, I'm talking about um, you know, microbial products that are added to the soil, things that contain, you know, Bacillus subtilis, uh, you know, Pseudomonas, Trichoderma, you know, th- these sorts of like specialized microbial products that, that we're seeing pop up a lot more in agriculture. Yeah. And it's kind of neat, you know, seeing the data behind it too that show that these products do have such a benefit in, in building a healthy root zone to allow the roots to kind of have this symbiosis of like um, their water and the organic elements that are in the root zone. Um, 
You know, when it comes down to it, and you see this in the good and bad too, a bad example of it is the Chesapeake Bay. Nutrients, mineral salts or otherwise, act as food for, as a food source, as an energy source for these, these in this case, of these good um, biostimulants in the root zone. So again, they're useful in that they're providing a very soluble and available energy source right that they don't really have to work for you know it kind of just bumps right into them and it causes those populations to thrive again we go back to the thing of um, application rate you overdo this even slightly and you're going to see negative effects quickly but if you do provide it in a way that it is this constant energy source so you're providing like a thriving environment for these biostimulants you can really see the positive effects of them in your your growing environment quickly because it's like, oh, yay, look at this. This makes me happy. I'm going to grow well, and then it's going to provide such a positive benefit for the plant growth too. Now, what are you seeing specifically with mycorrhizal fungus? You know, I've heard high P can cause the, uh, uh, you know, reduce infection rates because the plant's getting what it needs directly um, already um, from a from a fertilizer source in terms of cannabis and mycorrhizal fungus are you seeing any research there or any results um, in your programs you know we jack the jacks programs that we put together have a very different kind of outlook on phosphorus levels and application than you will see kind of out in you know scrolling the internet um our application of phosphorus is um, a targeted time and a that that is right at between the vegetative and reproductive state, where we really flood the root zone with phosphorus to kind of stimulate the change from the vegetative state to reproductive, and then we shut it off. So it's almost like a one little shot boost. Um, I. From what I've heard and the growers that we work with, we haven't seen any negative effects on this, you know, uh, short targeted amount of phosphorus at this stage. We have heard from other growers, though, that if you use phosphorus at the high rates that you often will see, people saying that, that cannabis does quite well with these high, you know, you see these blossom boosters of like 50% available P205, that that it has had a negative effect for, you know, the infection rates of fungi. But, you know, I don't know. It's one of those things with our, our the research that we do here is we haven't done any trials ourselves. It's working with growers and hearing their recommendations and, and the positive and negative that they've been kind of able to reflect with us. But our way of going about phosphorus is is quite different than others. So we get a lot of feedback to that too. Like, wait a second, I should be using like a blossom booster all through flower. And we're like, no, you use it for a five to seven day period, potentially 10 day period. And that's it with the JAX program. So it's a little different. Well, I'm convinced that in general, growers still are overplying phosphorus, though it's gotten better. But there was this idea that plants need nitrogen and veg and phosphorus and flour and uh you know potassium that's, at the end i well, hear that a lot all the time too <laughs> I, i'm convinced that it's really potassium that's it's leading to a lot of the yield increases that we're seeing and so um and i could be wrong you know you're the plant nutrient or nutritionist here but um it seems to me that potassium is a much uh more important element uh, when we talk about you know finishing versus these yeah. PK boosters. I'm not sure the P is really doing a whole heck of a lot at that stage, but um, you know, I, I want to ask you about this. So I'm looking at your formulations right now on your website mm-hmm. um, and you have these, these very specific ratios. Can you talk a yep. little bit about uh, you know, why and how you came up with these formulations? Because this is something we can apply to organics as well. Um, you yeah. know, I think we can take some of these and um, you know, try and, and hit targets closer to them based on the research that's being done by, you know, companies and people like you? Yeah. Well, you you hit it right on the head. It's all about the ratios. 
So a lot of times when I'm building formulas for cannabis or other crops, it's about making sure we have those balanced ratios in between nitrogen and potassium or um, phosphorus or calcium and magnesium and sulfur or even the micronutrients, iron mm -hmm. to manganese and then zinc, boron and copper. We specifically pay attention to the ratios between that um, when we're building for specific crops. So super important. Um, for the way we set up our, our Jax nutrients, we we started developing these formulas in 2010. And, um, you know, people have used our version of Jax or Peter's fertilizer before that, you know, to grow cannabis. And they used all different formulas. And we would look at it and go, what are you doing? They would specifically use triple 20, 20, 20, 20 in veg. And then the Blossom Booster 10, 30, 20, all through flower. Or they would use this old school one, which is called Variegated Violet, which was a 10, 52, 10, all through flower. And we would be like, this is ridiculous. Why are people doing this? But this was like, you know, what everyone thought that you should do. Mm -hmm. Even now, you'll see people using our Triple 20 and Blossom Booster 2 as part of the garden line. But... Um, when we started to dive in there and really look at the, the genetics and the, and the cultivars and the species that were available when we started and, and started playing with it, we found that manipulating ratios at the different um, crop stages really led to an overall healthier looking crop. That's how we started it. Like we were just going for, let's try and make a, a, a crop of, you know, this cultivar that looks like a healthy plant because we were running into different growers that would have like these terribly yellow, stocky looking things. And I'm like, this cannot be good. And then we started playing with the ratios at the different crop stages to kind of enhance, you know, terpene expression and yield. And that's how we <laughs> eventually from 2010 to the release of this line in 2017, kind of dialed in the formulas that you see as part of Jack's nutrients. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does. I see, um, and I'm, I'm trying to read your website here. It looks like uh, you have a part A and B, and so you're giving a little bit of phosphorus at the beginning, and then you go mm -hmm. to a 1500 that's just purely nitrogen uh, for veg and then in the part B, and then you switch over into flour where you give a fair bit, uh, you have a 10, 30, 20, it looks like, and then finish with yep. a 7, 15, 30. And this is all on the Jack's Nutrient website. So anyone can go and look at this. You don't have to you know, write down or memorize these numbers. Um, right. <laughs> can, you, uh, can you touch on sort of, uh, you know, each stage, uh, just a quick sentence or two on, on why, you know, from a plant perspective? Sure. Yeah, so there's really two different kind of ways that, to go about, you know, growing with our products, we always start with looking at your water. So we start at the water quality at, at the source that you'll be growing with. So are you using RO or are you, you know, using water from your well or your city? And we take a look at that and kind of form a baseline with, with what you're starting with. And then we try and match that to formula selection. Um, in veg, we really suggest a, a lower percent available phosphorus, P205, in the vegetative state. This, so these formulas you'll see appear nitrogen heavy, so they'd be like 15520, which is our tap formula, or 12416. So they, they appear like, oh, it, you know, it's very nitrogen heavy, which the ratio does allow for, but you're feeding at a parts per million of like 125 to 150. Mm -hmm. So it's that balance of the nitrogen to phosphorus to potassium. And you, most of the formulas there do have elevate in the, in the nutrient line for, for hemp and cannabis, almost always have slightly elevated potassium than nitrogen across all stages. Um, when we switch to flour, there is this um, period of time, the bud initiation phase, where we do promote and, and use a concentration of 
available phosphorus that does that is higher than almost anywhere else in our programs for this short burst of time. And it basically surrounds the root zone with phosphorus, and that makes it available for plant uptake for the short period of time. It really, you know, floods the soil solution, the small and large pore spaces with available phosphorus, and then it's over. So by continuing, by, by shutting that down, you don't have the negative effects of phosphorus, like, you know, excess stretch and, and, and that type of stuff that would cause a crop to really kind of look different um, as it grows through its flower stage. So really, it's only that small period of time. And then just then as you move to flower, again, we found that the ratios by decreasing the nitrogen and increasing the potassium, so having a slightly um, different ratio for nitrogen to potassium as the plant goes into its finished stage, it's it's shown great benefits to enhancing the yield and also the terpene expression. And it's also the micros and the choice of nitrogen that we use at those stages too. So it's kind of all like a mixture of this, but focusing on ratios through the whole program. That's, that's great. So you mentioned nitrogen. Um, it appears that cannabis prefers its nitrogen in the form of nitrate for the most part, um, mm-hmm. what I'm seeing. Can you talk a little bit about, you said, you know, nitrogen, the form of nitrogen and its importance? Yeah, and um, our formulas have, some of them have all nitrate nitrogen, and some do have a slight amount of ammonium nitrogen in there too. So the initial studies that we found um, was that there is benefits from having a mixture of an ammonium and nitrate source. We don't have urea in any of our formulas whatsoever. So that's just like an, an, we don't use that source of nitrogen. But one of the cool things we saw was like at the clone stage. So in the beginning, there was a lot of talk like, oh, for your clones or for your start, like taking this from seed, just feed at a lower nitrogen concentration of a balanced fertilizer and you will, you know, be able to have a successful clone clone stage and what we've found with our clone is a 15 6 17 it actually has a, a, a about a 20 percent ammonium nitrogen um, component and we found with the the ratio of that product with the micros all together we were able to speed up root formation and branching and establishment from a typical you know 10 to 14 days to 7 to 10 and we found that the plants really thrived when we got that ratio of ammonium to nitrate correct, which was kind of neat to see because back then people just thought, oh, no, just feed it lower strength and everything will be good. Hmm. And, and, we, and also everyone also thought, too, oh, you need a ton of phosphorus to start. Well, that was not the case at all. Our formula for clones is a 15 6 17. So it has it does not have that huge phosphorus number. It has the right amount of phosphorus with the ratio of nitrogen to potassium that makes things work. Yeah, so what are folks typically using for media with your fertilizers? And then how are your plants finishing um, in terms of the EC levels in the media as well as the um, look of the plant, I guess? Yeah, uh, people use all different media. I mean... Uh, In the beginning, it was just like, it seemed like everyone was using cocoa. We have a lot of, a lot of growers that do grow in rock wool and those types of um, inert medias. And then um, obviously, you know, soilless mix, the versions of that come on in and, and people make their own mixtures doing all these different things too. So the media can be several varieties of things. And then we, a lot of times when we set people up with programs, we look at their water and then also consider the media characteristics in order to start with a um, concentration that would be right for their grow. So if you check on the website, you'll see all these grow schedules, which are, which are really cool. And it gives you a great place to start with Jax because it, it will kind of identify the nutrient concentrations that, like you said, aren't too much, you know, and you're not overdoing it. It's never 
what what did someone say to me the other day? They were like, "Oh, well, I was mixing your fertilizer and I didn't think it was blue enough, so I add some added some more." I'm like, <laughs> "Oh my gosh, <laughs> that is not how you test the EC or strength of fertilizer." And you don't have to run into that with your organic side of it, Tad, right? <laughs> oh, all the time. But, people, I mean, not uh, so much the color, but people are like, oh, my buddy said I should use bad guano. So I added a bunch of bad guano or, you know, whatever that thing is. And you're like, no, I, you know, there's plenty of phosphorus already. You don't need more pee, you know, kind of thing. But right. <laughs> and and that's growers want to like, tinker, you know, that's, that's part of growing is you feel like you have to be doing something. And sometimes that gets carried away. A hundred percent. And you see that with our formulas too. That's why we kind of put those growth schedules out there because it gave everyone kind of a place to start tinkering, you know? And one of the useful things is too, when, when you're saying with EC, because again, our ECs are very different than other companies are because of the purity of the raw materials. So a lot of times people will say, oh my gosh, you know, that's, that's not, that's, that can't be right. You can't, you know, grow a crop with these ECs and, you know, we're like, no, that's, it's measured to be exactly that way. You have to add in your, you know, obviously the EC of the water that you're starting with, but this is all you really need to deliver those nutrients. Um, And then you'll also see people kind of tinkering around with their like watering practices. So you'll see different growers leaching, um, you know, and, and others not and, and recirculating systems and stuff. So at the end of the crop cycle, we do tend to see EC levels um, increasing because especially our finished formula does have a higher overall EC when you're only feeding at 100 parts per million of nitrogen. But we do recommend a four to seven day flush in most um, growing environments um, right before harvest. I did want to talk about that actually, because this is something that, um, well, one person got really upset with me on, on Apple podcast because I said, uh, you know, we don't really flush it with organic soils because the nutrients aren't for the most part, aren't in a a form that can be removed from the soil easily. I mean, if you, I guess have too much nitrates or sodium, things like that, you could flush out, but for the most part, it, it's not the same as growing, you know, with mineral salts. But I'd love to hear your thoughts right. on this. And if if you are, let's just say in a it, hypothetically, if you've got a perfectly dialed in system, in theory, I wouldn't think that there would be a lot to flush out. I agree with you. And we constantly in like our internal discussions talk about this. <laughs> okay. Because you're exactly right. We're we are suggesting feeding constant liquid feed at this conservative lower end rate to really just kind of make sure you're giving enough to the plant. We're also suggesting testing the plant through the crop cycle so you can really dial in where your nutrient concentration is both at the root zone and in the plant tissue. Um, So you shouldn't have to flush at all. However, we have found through multiple growers and people that worked with Um, our products and other products and it just seems like this is something that is is part of the culture here growing cannabis is that they feel that you know a flush increases the you know the beneficial characteristics of the end product so I've heard people say oh well I make sure I flush so I so you know you know when I either mostly smoke it it doesn't seem so harsh I honestly, that's personal preference. I really don't, you know, think that that's a, we haven't been able to show that that's a function of the nutrients being flushed out of the system, but that's what it's attributed to quite a bit. But you're right. If it's a, if it's a system that is um, exhibiting the nutrient concentrations perfectly for plant health and yield, you shouldn't have to flush at all. Has anyone done research where they've done tissue testing on plants that have been flushed versus not flushed, you know, with low EC in the media to show that there actually is less a, a mineral accumulation in the tissue to where when you did smoke it, it would be less, you know, quote unquote harsh? 
I mean, we've done our own versions of trials in multiple different like growing environments, like outside, inside, you know, closed system, open system. And the, the data just isn't clear. You know, there's nothing to say this is the best way. And that's where I think possibly as these universities do set up these environments where they can really dial in on specific. That would be something that'd be super interesting to know because it is a ton of personal preference too. Um, and, and varietal and cultivar specific, which is makes it even more difficult, you know? Yeah. And we hadn't even talked about plant stress and how that's impact on terpene expression or THC production, um, which is obviously a role too. like possibly these flushes at the end, you know, create more plant stress uh, due to the mm -hmm. water saturation, saturation, you know, affecting the root hairs, maybe causing the plant to produce more, you know, terpenes or cannabinoids, things like that. So that's something interesting too, in terms of targeted plant stress that I haven't seen a lot of research with cannabis on, but, uh, no, a lot of variables it has to be coming now. It's exciting. It's, I think we're in a very exciting stage to be. And I think anyone like in the, in, in, in this cool environment is ready to learn. I mean, and that's what I was talking to you earlier about, you know, horticulture is a community of people that are just starving for knowledge and you and it is plants and you know you think you know something about a plant and then just spending time with it and watching it and manipulating certain things you always are in a great state to learn more and I think and that's what I'm so excited about with Jax for just doing what we're doing on the everyday you know blending water solubles but also working with growers to try and you know help them you know reach their most optimum for their growing environment, even if it's a combination of, you know, uh, living soil or organics or different amendments and biostimulants, it's so fun. And I'm, I'm, I feel thankful that, to be in this industry at this time, you know? Oh, totally. Me too. I mean, how many opportunities do you have in a lifetime to work on a plant that you can actually do research on that's impactful? I mean, it, you talk about right. corn, you know, or some of these, you know, crops, there's so much research that's already been done. It's like, what, what's new to really try? Whereas with cannabis, it's yeah. it's a blank slate. And I love that. Yeah. And that's what's neat about it. Like the mineral side, we're trying as much as possible to provide pure, you know, as pure and, and, and high quality water soluble um, blends as possible. So that people, when they, you know, whatever they're trying to do, you know, and, and grow the crop, they know that if they come and they see something with jacks on it, there's research behind here. This is science-based knowledge. <laughs> and that's what, you know, you see a lot of these other companies out there, you know, doing this, that, and the other, and driving around cars with blah, blah, blah. Anyway, but this, this is where we need to get for our community, right? So we can all benefit from science factual knowledge. <laughs> You know, like I said, I'm a hardcore organic guy, but if we can move away from bottled nutrients, you know, even just yeah, oh to God. these powdered formulations, to me, that's a win. Because I realize that not everyone's going to go organic. And, uh, you know, while that may be my own life path, uh, I, I, there are right. reasons that people choose to grow with mineral salts. And if they're going to do it, like apply science, use the information that's out right. there and go with products that are going to be safer and pure and more concentrated um, for and the efficient. reasons that you listed. Yeah, totally. You know, and cost effective. So you're not shipping, right. You're not shipping things all over, you know, a truck full of water. It truly is a, a ratio of an efficient formula to deliver, you know, the concentration that, that you need. And it isn't like all this other BS involved, you know? So I want to, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't focus a little bit more on water because we're seeing, um, we're seeing some challenges on the organic side with people who are using RO water in regards to possibly heavy metal uptake, um, as well as just how water impacts nutrients. And, um, you know, obviously you have different formulations based on water quality. Can you talk about what you're looking at when it comes to water? I know that's kind of a big topic, um, but specifically, yeah. um, you know, I know RO wants to 
to buffer, but how do we, how do we accommodate, you know, uh, water and, and, and pH and, and these factors into our growing systems? Oh, and, and we spend a lot of time on this, just on, on, this is really the most important thing when we talk about what we deal with at Jack's every day. I mean, our, our laboratory on site, we probably have, you know, 50 to 100 different wa- people sending us water samples in a day um, on, on a, a slow day, just trying to take a look at, build their baseline to understand what important nutrient qualities are in their water. Um, when I look at a water source, especially when I'm matching nut- nutrition to it, is um, I look at the pH, the alkalinity, which obviously is a, um, a measure of the buffering capacity of the water, um, and then also a few of the um, secondary elements, mostly calcium, magnesium, and sulfur, to see you know what that buffering capacity or um, water alkalinity is from. Is it from something good or something bad? And then uh, the bad things that you don't want to see in your water is a lot of sodium and chloride. So we're looking at those elements just a quick and dirty glance, and you can tell right off the bat if this is a good water source that's going to help you or another type of water source where you're going to have to make some choices to to balance nutrients correctly for optimum, you know, plant nutrient uptake. Now, I know you can formulate around RO pretty easily um, on a chemical side, but for those of us on the organic side, uh, there's some more challenges. I mean, I know Mm -hmm. you have a little more chemistry background than I do. Um, I want to get a chemist on the show specifically to talk about water and heavy metals. But um, is there anything you can share along those lines in terms of, you know, using RO water in uh, an organic media in terms of some of the, the challenges around that and Yeah, risks. I mean, RO is a, is a tough, it's not a tough topic because it really, you know, in, in a lot of times when I'm talking to growers that are like, I would like to start, you know, growing cannabis or growing hemp and they don't have anything figured out yet. They don't know if they want to try an organic pathway. They don't know, you know, what their water's like. They don't know how they're even going to set up their their site. It's great to get people at that stage because you can really make some good decisions. And RO water is useful in that it takes out all of the potential bad that could come from a water source, right? So, you know, too high sodium, too high chloride, um, the boron is too high or the iron, um, whatever. But when in doing that, you really lose the good things that also come from water sources. So if you're working with a grower, especially in an organic setting where they, you know, are using RO, my first thought for organic or mineral side is that that grower needs to understand that every time they deliver water to their, you know, plant, they need to also make sure that they're building a, a solution in the root zone that has all of the, the essential elements that the plant needs for uptake. So in an organic setting, making sure that you have those sources of secondary and micronutrients that are not only immediately available, but are, you know, slowly available, so they're always there as a source, is important for a grower that is using an RO source. It's not as important if you have a really great well where you already have a nice ratio of calcium to magnesium, some sulfur, some micros in there. It kind of takes some of the pressure off. But RO, you know, really kicks it up to that next level where you have to remember at all times, you have to provide these essential nutrients for plant uptake. Yeah. Now, what about the fact that RO, you know, it's it wants to bond with, water wants to bond with something. It doesn't like surviving in a vacuum like that. So, um, mm-hmm. you know, we are like, for example, I had a, I had a grower using these uh, galvanized steaks and they, they were stripped pretty quickly. Um, right. <laughs> from, from watering with RO water. Um, well, I guess any water would eventually 
do it. But, um, you know, we were concerned possibly that might lead to higher heavy metal content. Um, how does RO water or water in general interact with, um, heavy metals? I know pH plays a big role, which we haven't really talked about in terms of uptake, but, um, can you, yeah. can you touch on the water aspect there? Yes, of course. So, you know, certain things, um, all nutrients really are more, uh, more or less available according to the pH that is in the nutrient solution. So in most cases for micronutrients, the more acidic of a pH of soil solution or a soil colored environment, um, the more available those ions will be for the plant to be able to take them up. And then the other way around too, as the pH gets above mostly like 6.2, 6.5, you'll see a pretty sharp decrease in how certain nutrients are available for plant uptake. Um, RO not having any, you know, any charge associated with it is constantly looking to balance itself by stealing, um, you know, one or two, you know, negative or positive charges to kind of make it, make itself get to equilibrium. Um, so it's just very interesting because what you have available in your soil solution or in your soil environment will interact back and forth with your water source. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I'm trying to think like now I forgot what your question was, Tad. So you'll have to remind me, but am I going on the right path? (laughs) Yeah. I'm just wondering how, you know, say water that is, you know, well water versus RO water, you know, water that has minerals in it. Um, what, what differences might we expect in a, in a soil media or soilless media in terms of uh, heavy metal uptake or um, other effects, you know, with a, a buffered well, water versus, you know, unbuffered water, I guess is my, my question. I think the main thing to be concerned about is the pH and, and the buffering because that does have a, you know, a effect on, on pH swings in, in the water source. If you have a, a completely pure water source that's living at a pH that is in the mid to low fives, almost anything, including micronutrients and heavy metals, are going to have just tend to be more available and soluble in that environment. So if you're using an RO water, um, in most cases, and, and with the use of a lot of the fertilizers that we have, we try to keep the um, pH between 6, 5, 8, and 6, 2 in order to keep that perfect kind of like mostly available but not too available on the acidic side or not unavailable at the basic side so that we can, you know, just allow a perfect ream of what's available. But if you're using any water source and it's living at a pH where where it makes things more available, you're going to see increased uptakes of heavy metals or otherwise. So pH and and alkalinity of of the water source is most important, um, no matter where you're getting your water from. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, You know, those were my main questions for you today. Was there anything else you wanted to uh, talk about or add? No, I feel like, I don't know, we got to talk about a lot of fun things. I hope that, you know, we can continue our relationship. I'm super happy to be asked to be on your um, podcast. Thank you so much. And I think this is what the future of our industry needs to always consider. There's people with knowledge on their little sector of things. Like, I'm like a a mineral You know what I mean? So that's what I do on the day to day. But conversations like this, that you are, especially through your podcast, you're able to bring people together, I think is only going to benefit our industry. So I applaud you and thank you so much for having me on. It's been great. Absolutely. I enjoyed the conversation and uh, please reach out as, you know, new research becomes available. I'd love to get back on and chat about that too. Yeah, we at at Jax are trying to help answer some of these like 
basic plant nutrition on the mineral side questions. So we've been doing all these little like get technical videos. So these suggestions, what your kind of um, group would love to hear us address, please reach out. We're, we really like building our and that's kind of where we're at. So I appreciate it, Tad. Thanks so much. Thank you. That was Dr. Carrie Peters with J.R. Peters and Jack's Fertilizer, and you are listening to the Cannabis Cultivation and Science Podcast. Don't forget to check out the podcast page at www.kisorganics.com. Just click on the Learn tab, then Podcast. And if you want to support us or the podcast, please take a look at the variety of soil amendments, soils, lighting fixtures, and other growing products that we offer on our website. We carefully research all the products we offer and manufacture to make sure they are science-based and meet our standard of quality. Thank you for listening.